as 632 so we are going to call ourselves to order please if you would all stand with me for the pledge I had to turn around to see who it was there. Okay. Roll call, please. Eva Henry. Steve Odoricio. Here. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Sean Wood. Chrissy Panganello. Anthony Graves. Present. Robin Kniech. Kevin Flynn. Roger Partridge, Dave Weaver, Gail Watson, Libby Zabo, yeah. Bob Pfeiffer, John Marriott, Here. Bob Roth, Here. Larry Vidham, Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Ann Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Here. Tara Radloff, Jeff Blue, George Teal, yeah. Doris Trular, Catherine Hyder, Laura Christman, Earl Holan, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Sarah Karras Graves, Casey Brown, Ron Rakowski, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Hello. Dana Gutwein, Here. Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Here. Jacob Lofgren, Larry Strock, Wynn Shaw, Here. Joan Peck, Marsha Martin, Ashley Stolzman. Here. Sorry, did someone? Okay. <laughs> She's being quick. <laughs> She's being quick. Connie Sullivan, Here. Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Chris Larson. Jordan Sowers, Here. John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Here. Rita Dozal, Here. Jessica Sandgren, Here. Herb Atchison, yes. Bud Starker, Here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Present. Bill Van Meter. Very good. We do have a quorum. We also have a whole slew of new members and alternates. And I, I know some of you are here, some are not. I'm going to introduce all the new folks. Um, and if you're here, please wave or acknowledge somehow so that we can see who you are. So starting with uh, Sam Weaver, who's the new alternate for Boulder. Then we have Kim Groom, who's the new alternate for Broomfield. Benjamin Hussaman, who's the new alternate for Commerce City. He's up on the front row there. Uh, George Lance, new alternate for Greenwood Village. Uh, Dana Gutwein, she's been here before, but she's now the member and no longer the alternate. And uh, Jacob Labure, boy, I knew I was going to blow it, is the uh, new alternate for Lakewood. Karina Elrod, the new member from Littleton, up top there. Kyle Schlachter, the new alternate for Littleton. Uh, Marcia Martin, who is the new alternate for Longmont. Jordan Sowers, new member for North Glen, previously was the alternate. Julie Duran Melica, who is the new alternate for North Glen, right in the front there. Uh, Roberta Mooney, Mooney, who's the new alternate for Sheridan. Jessica Sandgren, new alternate or new member for Thornton. Okay. And uh, Jackie Phillips is the new alternate for Thornton. Allison Hiltz is my new alternate in the city of Aurora. I don't see her. Linda Olson from Inglewood. Is Linda Olson here? Uh, Bud Starker is the new member for Wheat Ridge. Don't hold it against him, but Bud and I have served on many boards together in the past 
in the in the construction industry. So uh, he's uh, very used to being on boards and commissions. And that is all I had. Did I miss anybody that's a new yes. member or new alternate? I don't see anybody. And we're saying goodbye today to Joe Jefferson, probably a few others. I don't know what voters voted him a judgeship, but. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, constituents in town. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, is this Doris's last meeting? I wasn't aware of that. Okay. All right. Is there anybody else that's leaving this board that we need to acknowledge? So welcome to all the new members and alternates and, and a sad goodbye to the ones that are leaving. All right, have a motion to approve the agenda? Have a motion and a second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All right, agenda item five is the report of the chair. A uh, couple of things. First of all, there was a little confusion on the agenda that went out the first time with the use of asterisks. And, and honestly, I don't think there was anybody that hardly that really even noticed that the asterisks were there. We don't know the history of the asterisks. Um, and they won't be on the next agenda. <laughs> we were thinking about blaming somebody who's no longer here because they're not here to defend themselves. But basically, the, the idea was the asterisk indicated something that was an action item. And the confusion was that there was an informational briefing that had an asterisk. And it caused a lot of consternation and confusion and we apologize for that but as Mr. Rex said the asterisks will no longer exist so that will not be an issue anymore. Uh, report on the regional transportation I was not at the meeting I'll ask Director Atchison to give a report. It should be pretty short both items that were discussed at RTC are on your agenda as action items tonight so we'll discuss them at that time. Thank you. Report of the performance engagement committee. Who's, the, who's our uh, vice for that? Mike, please. Mike. While I was at the last meeting, I'm not sure exactly where we stand, so I cannot make a good report. A good short report. Uh, finance and budget. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair. We did not have a meeting. However, in executive committee, we were brought to the attention that uh, Doug Rex has a new headshot. <laughs> if you guys want this autographed, uh, I think there's only, what, five, 6,000 left? Right, right. Please, please see Doug after the meeting. We'll be dropping him from planes later on this week. And for a price, he'll sign one for you. All right, next on the agenda, agenda item six, is the report of the executive director. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, th those were made up for our DC trip uh, last week. Whatever. So they're limited edition. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a few things for your information today. On your table, we have a number of items that I'd like to draw your attention to. The first is um, a workshop for newly elected municipal officials on, on, your, uh, on your desk. This is being done in conjunction with uh, CU Denver. Uh, we've, we've had some conversation with them. It looks like a pretty good program. We encourage you, if you are newly elected, um, to participate. Uh, let me see here. Um, our annual award celebration, as you all know, or I announced this last week, is scheduled for April 25th at the Higher Regency, just down the street here. Um, the, it's entitled this year, People Place Elevated. Um, and the nominations are now open for, uh, for both of our award categories, the Metro Vision Awards, as well as the John B. Christensen Awards. Um, you can, um, nominations close on January 31st, and if uh, you'd like some uh, additional information on both of those categories, uh, you should find that on our website. It should, the, the website is much improved over last year, so hopefully you making your nominations will be easier than ever. Uh, winter Bike to Work Day. This is this, this one right here. This is, uh, we're pretty excited about this. It's February 9th, which is a Friday. Um, we've been working with CDOT to have the, this is the first ever statewide effort for, um, for uh, common date and branding. Um, so we really would encourage you to help us and spread the word and encourage our communities and individuals to participate in that event. Um, let me see, I think that's all for now at the table. Um, 
Dr. Cog was honored. We received an award from the Colorado Business Roundtable, and this is it here. Stand. Oh my God, it's heavier than I thought it was. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, we, this is from the Colorado Business Roundtable. Steve, Steve Erickson, uh, our communications and, and marketing director, he, he accepted it on our behalf. Um, it was, uh, it's known as the Collaboration in Industry Award, and we prevailed in the government and economic development category. We were recognized for bringing regional communities, which of course is all of you here, our Way to Go partnership and Bike to Work Day, which includes a collaboration of over 700 business partnerships. So that's pretty cool, and we're, we're uh, very appreciative of that recognition. And thank you, Steve, and all, all your folks over in Overing Cam for the great work that you do. Um, we had a kind of a Boomer Bond alumni event here last week um, uh, where we really, you know, it was really focused on, on those, those members that have, that have participated in our Boomer Bond assessment tool and had a debrief on, on uh, you know, kind of the, the efforts that we've done thus far and, uh, and how we can improve this process. Um, the, it was held on the 13th of December and it really allowed us again to really look at how, you know, what we've accomplished through this process and how we can improve it going forward. So I would truly and sincerely want to thank uh, the communities of Sheridan, Federal Heights, Idaho Springs, Nakono, Frederick, and Bennett for participating with us over the past several years on this initiative. I think everybody that's, in, that's enrolled and have done this have, been, have seen results. And uh, I would strongly encourage anybody that is interested in this that doesn't have an assessment of where they are with their aging communities that, that you participate in the, in the next round. And we'll be happy to provide you with any information on that uh, that you would like. Um, on behalf of the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, we hosted a uh, technical workshop on local update of census address program in early December. We had about 103 attendees in that event, uh, both in person and remotely throughout the state. Um, the census data, as you know, is used for, um, uh, to apportion seats in Congress as well as the distribution of federal funding. So it's obviously very important that we have proper addressing and, uh, and an accurate representation of the people that live here in this region. So uh, we've been doing this several, several years now. We've been holding some, uh, some census workshops on their behalf. Um, and I thought it was interesting um, that this came out of their mouth, that uh, Dr. Cog is the most organized, most supportive Cog that they, that they deal with. So I thought that was pretty cool. And appreciate the work that, um, that Ashley Summers and her folks do in information systems. They're, they're fantastic. Well, the chairman, the vice chairman, Mr. Atchison, and myself and Jayla and our federal, federal lobbyist, Mickey Farrell, were in D.C. last week, made some trips up on the hill to visit our delegation, and Mickey, and Mickey and Jayla and back. And uh, I, I thought they were quite successful. Um, we went up there with the sole purpose, well, really two purposes. One was to talk about our federal, federal uh, AAA monies. Um, as you all know, we're operating under CRs right now, one through the 22nd of this month. And there's, um, there's uh, uh, hope, well, at least hope now, that there there's, will be a CR that will extend that through January 19th. But the bottom line is we really do need a spending bill. It's very difficult to run a program like this not knowing, you know, what exactly or when you're going to get the money, obviously. Because we, you know, our funding that we use, we redistribute that out to our contractors for service, right? So particularly in the area of meals and transportation, um, we have 30-plus contractors that we work with. And, you know, we cannot guarantee them at this date that that monies are going to be available for them to continue their service. So we're going to have to stop service. I mean, that's the bottom line. So we feel pretty comfortable where we are through the middle of March. But if, uh, if there's not a quick fix or if there's not a, a fix, a long-term fix associated with this, we are, um, we are really concerned about it. So we, we went up there to uh, make sure to bring that message. The others related, related to the Highway Trust Fund. Um, we've had conversations around this table for years about the, uh, you know, the, the pending doom of the Highway Trust Fund, which is used for funding. Uh, it's the source of federal funding for our, our transportation system. Um, we're ex with the, uh, there's expectation of a $126 billion deficit in that Highway Trust Fund by, by the end of 2026. Um, so that's significant, obviously. And there has been some talk up there the administration has floated out just softly about the, you know, the concept of maybe fuel tax being increased to, um, to come up with some, some um, source of revenue. Um, so we went up there. Seven cents is what's been floated out there. It really 
is not what we need. We need more than that if we're looking at a, f a federal fuel tax. So we went up there just to explain the pros and cons of all that kind of good stuff. But ultimately, I think everybody understands we're going to need it's, – it's a diminishing source of money because with fuel economy of vehicles and electric vehicles and all that kind of good stuff that we need to have another funding mechanism. And we've talked about, you know, a vehicle miles travel tax or a road users tax, however you want to categorize that, as a – is a probable source going going forward. Our CDOT uh, conducted a pilot this past summer, and there's other states around the country, most notably um, the state of Oregon, that have done a tremendous amount of work in this area, and um, I think it does show some promise. Last but not least, um, I would like to just recognize our own chairman. Chairman Roth was selected to serve on the Colorado Municipal League's Executive Committee recently. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> And I believe he joins Director Dick, right, mm -hmm. on the executive committee that, that serves on the board. So we now have two moles there for, uh, to, work, to work their magic over CML. <laughs> no, thank you, sir, very much. And that's my report. I didn't know you had that on there. Um, so a couple, just a couple of quick comments on the D.C. trip. First of all, uh, Mickey did a really good job of explaining on the transportation funding that the seven cents that's being bantered about is actually puts us in a deficit mode it's not a help and the 15 cents or 15 cents plus is what we need so just to put in the back of your mind if you're talking to constituents or staff or whomever that the seven cents sounds good but it's actually a deficit the other thing that I wanted to mention is for those of you who don't know maybe everybody does but 14 degrees is far different in D.C. than it is in Denver. 14 degrees in D.C. is cold. That is really cold. All right. Uh, next on the agenda is agenda item 7, which is public comment. There's up to 45 minutes allocated for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional speaker requests beyond the 45 minutes, we'll take them at the end of the meeting. We do request there be no public comment on which there's been a prior public hearing. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to address the board this evening? Come on forward. When you get to the mic, if you would just give us your name in the next three minutes or yours. I'll get the full 45 minutes if there's no one else. <laughs> no? No. Okay. no. I was informed I get three. I didn't rehearse, so I probably should have, but uh, I'll be brief. Um, well, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Brown. I'm uh, Director of uh, Policy and Research for a uh, Colorado-based uh, free enterprise think tank. We've done some work related to residential uh, housing growth restrictive me measures, particularly one in the uh, city of Lakewood that uh, may rise to a city council vote, and then I believe um, as of today, their uh, title board uh, may have set a title for an initiative, Initiative 66, to restrict residential housing growth across 10 Front Range counties and the entire state to uh, arbitrarily cap it at 1%. So I'm here to at least <clears throat> make you aware of our work and make you aware that this issue is growing. Uh, through my research, I've found that this runs directly counter to the priorities established by Dr. Cog as part of Metro Vision to prioritize development along transit, to prioritize development in areas which will alleviate uh, transportation congestion, green space development, um, and, and make housing more affordable. And so this issue, I think, would be of, is of, uh, to the extent that it gains more traction, gains signatures, potentially is on the ballot for next year, would be an issue that this organization at least should consider, you know, deploying your extensive planning and um, technical capabilities to, to understand and help educate the citizens and elected officials as to the unintended consequences of further restricting residential growth at a time when we're seeing unprecedented, unprecedented levels of, uh, <clears throat> you know, Coloradans leaving Colorado as a result of congestion, high housing prices, and uh, a whole host of issues. So I'm not sure where I'm at in three minutes, but um, that was all I wanted to convey. I do have some papers, if I'm able to 
leave. I think I printed enough. I, I left, brought 50. So you're able to um, look into the research a little bit more. I have some highlights from our uh, Lakewood study and a memo that I submitted to the Legislative Council ahead of their fiscal impact statement uh, <clears throat> on this uh, initiative, which uh, to this point they have not submitted a formal economic and fiscal impact, but I again would implore you that uh, for local jurisdictions, capping residential housing growth at the county level would have significant ramifications for local city government and the ability to build housing when and where it's needed. So I um, wanted to make sure that it's on your radar and let you know about our work. So if, with that, if you would, you could bring the handouts sure. up here and we'll make sure that they're passed out. And your time's up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to address this board? Seeing nobody else, we're going to move on to agenda item eight. Agenda item eight is move to approve the consent agenda, where the, that's basically the minutes from the last meeting. Any corrections or modifications? Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, aye. Opposed, nay. On to the action agenda. We have two action items this evening. Agenda item nine is under your attachment B, and it's discussion of the amendments to the 2018 through 2021 TIP and Todd Cottrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So attachment B for the 18 through 21 TIP amendments contain four amendments for your consideration this evening. The first is the Fast Tracks North Corridor, um, sponsored by RTD. Uh, and this would add local funding and adjust the opening date to 2019 to reflect a revised schedule. The next three are all sponsored by CDOT Region 1. The first being the Bridge on System Pool. Uh, and this amendment would add FY21 funding and provide the latest funding estimates for fiscal years 18, 19, and the exist existing pool projects. The third amendment for your consideration is the Region 1 Surface Treatment Pool. Uh, and this amendment would add $6 million um, in funding to FY21 to fund eight new pool projects. The final amendment um, by CDOT Region 1 is uh, the Central 70 project. Uh, and this amendment has two main objectives. The first being to separate, separate out the TIFI loan from the existing bonds and loan funding. And two, to adjust the years of funding and increase the total project cost by $35 million to cover additional pre-development costs. So with that, I'll uh, take any comments or questions that you may have. Comments or questions? Director Atchison. Just as the RTC was considering this on Tuesday, um, one of the questions came up on the piece for the fast track funding. At the NATO meeting this past week, uh, we had received information that RTD representative presented that the testing of the end line, which is the North I-25 line, would not start till 2020. But their last update to us was that it was a 2019, which had been a given to us about two months previous to that. So we spoke to the uh, director of uh, RTD and here on Tuesday, and we're not sure where the confusion is coming from. Uh, they're thinking the testing is going to start in 19, but what's being presented at a, at a NATO meeting, and by the way, the elected officials had not been given any advanced information that there was another delay, but that project's about two years behind right now. This amendment does not affect that, and we've asked them to, at the, by the time we have the next meeting with NATO, to come back with a clarification of is it 2020 or is it 2019. But we still recommend it from the RTC that we pass this resolution. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second discussion. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you very much. Agenda item 10 is under attachment C, and it is discussion of air quality conformity. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening. 
this fall we opened an amendment cycle to uh, two of our major plans here at Dr. Cog, our MetroVision plan and our 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. This item concerns the transportation plan, the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. When we open an amendment cycle, as opposed to a major plan update, which we'll be doing over the next couple of years, when we do this amendment cycle, what we're really asking for giving project sponsors is the opportunity to make any needed changes um, to projects that are, that are in the plan or to add new projects um, if they have funding to do so. Um, so in your memo um, on, on this item, in your memo there is a table that shows uh, the uh, shows the amendments that we received from project sponsors. In this round of amendments to our regional transportation plan, most of the amendments that we received were from CDOT uh, to reflect the first bit of funding from Senate Bill 267, which passed in the last legislative session. There's also a couple of amendment requests from local governments, um, and there's even a couple of um, proposed projects that local governments are asking to be uh, removed from the long-range plan, which happens every once in a while. So what, you're, what we're asking for uh, tonight is approval of modeling networks. So to be very clear on that, uh, we're not asking you to approve the amended plan. That will come later. Um, actually, we're anticipating bringing that to you in April. Uh, we go through a public hearing process. Uh, which we'll be doing early next year. What we're asking for tonight is based on these amendments that we've received, we model them first internally um, on sort of the traffic side using our traffic model. And then to meet federal requirements, we model uh, with the state uh, for regional air quality conformity, uh, which is done by the Air Pollution Control Division of the state, uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, so we're asking for approval of the transportation networks to model. The map on the screen, which is also in your packet, um, is the regionally significant, the major capacity roadway projects in the plan and also in your packet um, is a similar map for uh, the rapid transit projects such as fast tracks. There were not any changes to the uh, rapid transit network. When we do air quality conformity modeling, I do want to emphasize we're not modeling individual projects. We are modeling the entire network of projects in the plan. Uh, so we'll be modeling the network of, of um, what's in the plan with the proposed amendments. And that's what's reflected on this map for the roadway projects. Um, another aspect, another federal requirement related to air quality that I want to highlight for you for transparency is that we have a federal requirement that the projects that we illustrate in the plan and that are on this map are grouped in our plan in a series of what we call air quality staging periods. Um, we don't so much look at the individual year of completion or opening of a project in the plan. For many of these projects through 2040, we don't actually know that yet. But we do put them in 10-year or 5-year buckets of when we think they will be staged for opening through the life of the plan to 2040. In the current plan, we have three air quality staging periods. Uh, 2015 to 2024, 2025 to 2034, and, 25, and 2035 to 2040. Um, in order to meet some federal requirements and, and given that the time is progressing, uh, we're going to recalibrate our air quality modeling starting with 2020. So we're proposing to go from those three stages to two stages, which would be 2020 to 2029, 2030 to 2040. This doesn't really affect anything else about these projects, but it is a recategorization of how we portray them in the plan. So I wanted to highlight that as well. Um, so with that, again, the motion that we're asking for is to approve the um, networks uh, to model uh, for these plan amendments. As I mentioned, we will have a public hearing early next year, uh, which will include the air quality conformity results of, of that work, um, public hearing, and then we'll bring it back to you. As I said, in April, we're anticipating for uh, uh, asking for approval of the plan as amended. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions or comments? Director Shaw. Are there other sections of roads that are shown here that could be um, submitted or updated? How, how does that happen? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, again, first let's differentiate between a major plan update, which this is not, but we do that every four years per federal requirements. This is an amendment cycle, and in an amendment cycle, there is an opportunity to make those kind of changes, but only if funding is identified. Um, there are many federal requirements that we have to meet in this process. One of them is what's known as fiscal constraint, which is the notion that basically you have to have the money to pay for the projects you put in the plan. So when we do an amendment cycle, we typically get a couple things in that vein. One is, in this particular case, as I mentioned, we're getting a few new projects 
projects from CDOT based on those new Senate Bill 267 revenue. So that's new revenue. They're adding some new projects. Uh, we also get projects from local governments for consistency with their, uh, with your, I should say, capital improvement programs. Sometimes you have something in your CIP and you want to similarly reflect that in our plan uh, because you have local revenues to pay for those projects. So that's typically what we see. But in this amendment cycle, we did not have new money. This was not a call for new projects at this time. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second discussion. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. All righty. Informational briefings. Uh, actually, let me jump down to one thing just to mention. Under informational items, agenda item 13, I just wanted to mention that we won't be talking about that tonight, but the, the ask of the board uh, is for you to review our policy on state legislative issues and make any comments to Doug Rex via email. So let him know if there's anything that you see that, uh, you know, you, or you want to see different or whatever. So that, that's agenda item 13. Just take a look in your spare time i'm sure you have plenty of it right and uh, and comment to doug so then we're on to informational briefings agenda item 11 which is under attachment d and before uh mr rex gives us a presentation i thought it was important that we have a little bit of conversation about what we're looking at why we're looking at it a little background especially given the fact that we have a number of new members and new alternates and this is a a very big part of what we do here. Um, for those of you who may not know, basically Dr. Cog serves three functions. We are the Cog, the, the Council of Governments. We're the MPO, which is the Metro Planning Organization, and we're the AAA, which is the Area Agency on Aging. And one of the things that we talk about here is under the Metro Planning Organization, um, that's what this falls under, and that's by federal mandate that we are the Metro Planning Organization. So that's why we have a lot of uh, a lot of conversation and a lot of back and forth with the feds on the Federal Highway um, Administration. So as far as background is concerned, before we start this, the discussion, I wanted to just kind of reflect on where we were, where we are, and how we got here. Um, so a little background. As you recall, there were many on the board with the previous tip and call for projects and all that that felt like there was a, a huge equity issue and they felt like they didn't get their fair share of the very thinly spread peanut butter that we have to allocate for projects. Um, but there were, there were municipalities and counties that felt a little disenfranchised by the way the, the uh, process went before. And so after the last TIP uh, cycle went through, we asked staff to put together a working group to address how we could do it better moving forward, looking at what, what's a better plan of action than what we've done before. Uh, I know that previous directors who have been on this board, who I've talked to that were on the board 10 or 12 or 15 years ago, they, they absolutely hated having to come as an alternate or whatever what, during the tip cycle because it was very, very painful. So recognizing that this region is very diverse, the hope was that we could find a model that allowed shared local values to play a role, a very real role in the project selection. I think that this dual funding model, the regional versus sub-regional, actually uh, ac accomplishes that and that's what came out of the tip policy working group. Um, so I mentioned the Federal Highway Authority and, and uh, briefly touched on kind of their involvement in this, but in the development of the recommended model, the one that we're discussing now, the regional and sub-regional, staff and the TIP policy working group worked very closely with FHWA to ensure that they were comfortable with how we were uh, moving forward and the concepts that were being discussed and the proposed model was consistent with the federal planning regulations. Ultimately, the FHWA provided a letter as a part of the original TIP Policy Working Group white paper, which came out in February of 2017. 
That white paper laid out some of the activities that will need to be monitored for compliance. Again, I mentioned it earlier, since we have a lot of new faces in the room, we provided a copy of that letter uh, at your, your workplace there that you can take a look at what, what that was in February of 2017. So a few weeks ago, Director Atchison and I sat down with FHWA to get a better understanding of their position of where we are uh, in the process and what the conversations are and make sure that they understood the new model and, and were comfortable with it. Um, FHWA sees this as a pilot project, basically a one-year pilot project, and between Dr. Cog and FHWA, this is going to be monitored very closely for effectiveness uh, to make sure that it does provide equity for the entire region and to make sure that uh, that things go according to Hoyle, according to the way we, we think this model will do it. I want to be clear that FHWA doesn't dictate to Dr. Cog how we allocate the funds in the regional, the sub-regional. Uh, however, they do have a, a, a voice in making sure that when we go through our recertification process, that this is part of the conversation. Did we do things judiciously? Did we handle things the right way? So although they don't have a direct say in uh, what that funding split is, um, they, they were cautious in telling us that they really wanted to make sure we were judicious in determining what the split is to make sure that there's enough funding in the regional pot to have very deliberate conversations about big regional projects. I think the biggest important word here is collaboration and we talk about collaboration but that's what FHWA is after that's what Dr. Cog is after so on to the discussion itself um, I want to talk a little bit about the discussion that's in front of the board tonight and as you know the tip policy working group first provided a proposal for the funding split in June which is a minimum of 70 percent for the sub-regional pot and since then, the board has deliberated as to what the proper split should be. I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, but I've used it before, so I'll use it again. I think that there's a successful negotiation if nobody is completely happy. If nobody gets everything they want, but everybody gets some of what they want, you've probably led a successful negotiation. Based on the last couple of meetings, there seems to be a pretty clear divide on this board as to what that split should be and obviously there's uh, there's people that are camped very firmly in one very uh, distinct side polarized side and people camped very distinctly in the other polarized side with that background and that conversation or not conversation I guess it's a monologue um, I wanted to kind of establish some curves, some curbs for our conversation tonight. I'd like to start off the discussion, and, and we can talk about this more now, we can talk about it more later, but I'd like to start off the conversation with the, as if the, the sub-regional sub and regional split is 70-30. If we can say that we're going to start off the conversation with that, uh, with that assumption, and then everything else that we're going to talk about are the other issues surrounding it. I think that we can get a good start on moving forward and get that collaboration and break down some of those walls. So that's, that's what I'm advocating for. I've talked to the executive board members and put this idea forward to them, and they were supportive of it. And so I'm presenting it to the full board, saying that that's where I would like to start the conversation with the understanding that we're at 70-30. So let's have a discussion about the 70-30 split, keeping in mind that new concepts recommended by the uh, TIP working group that staff will present this evening. When we get to the point of discussing the funding split, if you don't believe it should be 70-30, please be prepared to explain why with, uh, with good, good facts behind it. And uh, I, I'm hoping that we are not going to have Groundhog Day and we can I'm hoping that the 70-30 will hold and I firmly believe that with the polarization that's happened that's where we would have ended is 
That's my belief. Um, so that's, that's my proposal for the evening. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rex for the presentation. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, golly, I seem like I should accelerate this so you guys can get to your conversation after, after, uh, after those remarks. Um, I do recognize there are a lot of new faces in the room. I, I was so shocked when uh, I was just I was leaning over the chairman's shoulder when uh, Connie was showing him all the new members and new alternates and the like. Um, so I know this is going to be drinking through a fire hose. There's no doubt about it. And you're going to get half truths, half stories, and everything else in my presentation here tonight. Um, so I'm going to just start with an open invitation that uh, if, there are, if there are those present or if your alternate is not here tonight but you think it's worthy of them to get together with me individually to go through this, provide them with some of the background on, on this concept, I'd be more than happy to do that. So um, please don't feel, don't be shy about, uh, about reaching out. I'd be more than willing to do it. Now, with that said, um, as the chairman suggested, um, you know, we are looking at a new model for the allocation of our funding um, as part of our transportation improvement program, or the TIP. And uh, it is a model which um, is not widely used throughout the country. Uh, most notably is being used by Puget Sound Regional Council. And we'll talk about that here now in a little bit. But the whole concept is, um, is different in that the, uh, the way we used to do it was a more centralized process in that uh, the members would submit projects to Dr. Cog. We would uh, rank those projects or score those projects based on uh, criteria that was approved by the board and then basically, you know, you know, go down until we can't fund anymore. And um, that was our process. At least that was very simple, simplified, obviously. Too bad it wasn't that simple. Um, because we have first phase and second phase, I won't get into it. But anyway, so then we, um, so the TIP Policy Work Group, as the chairman uh, mentioned, um, came back to the board and suggested a different model. And this model, which is used by Puget Sound, it's uh, what we're calling a dual model. It's a regional, sub-regional model in which uh, you have two pots. You have a regional pot and you have a sub-regional pot. The regional pot would be used primarily on higher level facilities, those larger regional projects that the chairman mentioned. And the sub-regional pot would be uh, proportioned out to a sub-geographic area, right, proportionally allocated. And we chose, as did Puget Sound Regional Council in Seattle, to sub-allocate that money for planning purposes to, to, the, uh, to the county level, county small c. It does not go to the county government, but all the communities within that county have, have uh, uh, equal opportunity to, um, to decide how they want to spend their or make a recommendation on projects back to the full board. So that's real quick the uh, what this, this new model is. Um, this slide, I think, is tremendously important. It lays out the, 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 uh, the two, uh, two shares, the regional share and the sub-regional share, and the, uh, the set-asides that we've uh, traditionally had. But the important thing is actually what you can't see very well on this slide is the red arrows, um, that everything flows back to the board for, for uh, final approval. Um, what uh, the sub-regions will do in your sub-regional forms and your committee work is make a recommendation of projects back to the full board. Um, I would suggest as part of that project process that the chairperson of that sub-regional forum will come and present back to the full board their list of projects that they are recommending and the reasons why. Uh, and the reasons that they, they will have to defend their selections based on how it uh, complies with the, Metro Vision, with the tenets of MetroVision, how it complies with the, uh, the, the board adopted focus areas, and I'll, I'll show these here in a second. And, uh, and those types of things. How did it improve safety and, you know, what was the, you know, why were these projects chosen, right? Really, you know, ultimately sell, sell the, the package of projects. So what we have, there have been uh, accomplishments today for sure, but that the board has done. This is an iterative process and uh, it's new for all of us, so it's gonna, there's going to be some warts associated with this. It's not going to be not going to be all groovy all the time, um, but we have been able to approve uh, a couple things, the set-asides, and we thank you very much for, for, uh, for getting that out of the way. Um, we have $49.4 million of pro programs and, and pools um, uh, were, were approved by the board back in uh, August, September time frame. And the other thing was the establishment of the TIP focus areas. Those were at our, at our annual board retreat or board workshop. We, um, um, this was one of the items that we wanted to come out of that meeting with a, with a recommendation back to the full board 
of uh, focus areas is basically, you know, what we have four years worth of money in this next tip. What is it we would like to do to make life better in this region? What we'd like to concentrate on to make life better in this region? And the three that were chosen was to improve mobility infrastructure for, uh, and services for vulnerable populations, increase the reliability of the system, and improve uh, transportation safety and security. Um, so, so here we go. So, um, you know, the last time we met was at the work session back in November, and um, uh, you know, when we left that meeting, the TIP Policy Work Group had an opportunity to meet several times, maybe even three times since uh, since you know, since the last time we met, and we 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 tried to to, um, to provide more clarity or provide more of a comprehensive proposal for you all for for eligibility. Um, so what I'm going to speak to here in the next few slides is really um, uh, it's, uh, it's highlighted in attachment one of your packet. It's the, it's the regional share framework and eligibility. Um, so what, and, I, and we hope that this, you know, some of the concepts um, that I'm going to discuss here will help you in some of your, uh, you know, discussions ultimately with approving the eligibility, but also on the fund funding split as well. Um, so what was proposed by the TIP policy work group with regards to the eligibility of projects was that um, we follow kind of the Seattle model in this respect, that, the, um, that uh, applications for the regional share would only be eligible from the subregions, the subregions plus CDOT plus RTD. Each subregion, uh, based on the proposal, uh, would get an opportunity to submit two proposals for the regional share. RTD would get two, as I suggested. And CDOT would also get to. The only caveat on CDOTs is that the um, the their um, the the commitment in principle of the $25 million for for the Central 70 project would be one of their applications. They would have to reaffirm that 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 uh, that that funding um, that funding commitment. Um, some other concepts that was that, that were discussed and as part of the proposal for you this evening for your for your uh, deliberation was that uh, and I know we had conversations about this at the last at the November work session about you know containing the Central 70 project in as part of the regional pot or, or treating it as a set aside. It was the uh, consensus of the TIP policy work group to um, to include the Central 70 project in the regional share. Um, primarily because it, by all accounts, it is a regional project. There's, there's, there's no, you know, I mean, there's no, I mean, it is. It's a regional project. It, is, it would, it would be eligible as part of our framework um, that we laid out in, in the uh, associated maps that are part of that attachment one, and uh, they just felt that it was better served to be in the regional share. The other thing we talked about are, are, are caps or our. Gee whiz. Uh, hold on one second. Yes, sir. Director Odorizio. Is that part of executive commitment, the executive board's recommendation? Are you guys making a recommendation as, on that as well tonight before we begin the rest of the conversations? No, our, our, our primary recommendation was just to start the conversation at the 7030, and, and uh, that's the framework that, by which we have the rest of the conversation. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so one of the other concepts we talked about were, were funding caps, right, on, on, on these projects. Because, you know, the, the regional pop money, at least it, uh, according to the, the white paper that we, we uh, provided to you all back in, back in February, was that the regional pop money would go towards these larger regional projects and it would be, it would be a lesser share, would help in basically getting that project over the finish line, let's say. It, it would not, we would not, um, you know, while it is certainly eligible, it, the concept was that it was like kind of last money into a project. So, um, so what was suggested and what we talked about in this meeting, we really had two options, and we wanted to float those out to you all for your discussion this evening. Was one of a cap, um, uh, so you couldn't request funding that funding could not exceed 50% of the total project cost, and it would be capped at at 20 million. So we, with the exception of the Central 70 project, of course, because that one was already, we have a commitment in principle for $25 million. Um, and of course, the, the alternate to that, which is the exact opposite, is no maximums on funding requests. And uh, we'd just like to get your reaction to that at, uh, at the time of uh, discussion. 
Oh, the other, the other point that's worth uh, commenting on is that, you know, in the evaluation process, you know, when we're, you were in the process of developing uh, for, your, for your consideration some uh, evaluation criteria for the region's share right now, that uh, I, we believe that uh, that criteria, there would be some emphasis placed on projects that uh, had a higher match rate uh, others, so basically that you're able to leverage um, uh, the federal money with uh, more of another source of money, whether that be local or other state money or whatever that might be. Um, as far as proposed eligibility by project categories, um, uh, you know, the, there's a couple key changes that, the, to this that you hadn't seen before. BRT managed lanes, of course, have always been eligible in our proposal. Um, bicycle facilities is a little is being treated a little differently than what it was before. Uh, we were suggesting that uh, bicycle facilities for the regional share would be only those projects that were located on the one of the maps that are included in that attachment one. Uh, now that map. As, as I hope you all remember, was just a placeholder that we were hoping to, um, uh, once we, we finish our active transportation plan, we were going to swap that out. But timing being as it is, there's no way we're going to have that active transportation plan finished. But, um, but, we, but the, the, the work group felt comfortable, oh, sorry, I should probably finish the whole thought. That is basically anything that was on that map or, or a facility that has been approved and is on a local, any kind of local plan or county plan or, or something like that. Something that's documented that's gone through some kind of uh, public vetting process. Uh, we felt comfortable with that. Uh, I think some of the fear was that, well, you get a lot of these smaller projects. But we felt comfortable because now we're limiting uh, potentially the number of applications we can get from any one sub-region that um, we expect that if it is a bicycle pedestrian project that would be submitted, it would be of some significance. Um, so, and then uh, let me see. Oh, uh, freeways. Um, we talked about this at the last uh, last uh, work session about including major regional arterials as part of the uh, of the eligibility. And uh, that is the, uh, the proposal um, from the TIP Policy Work Group that freeways and major regional arterials be eligible for, um, for regional share. Capacity projects, of course, as always, ha uh, must be identified in the 20 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan, but operational projects are eligible anywhere on any segment within um, either on the freeway network or the major regional arterial network. So, and those maps, as you guys have seen those maps, and they're included in your packet as well. Railroad grade separations is not a change. Um, this, this last bullet is a change that we did not, and I believe we talked about this last time, that we did not have any um, any provisions for studies in, in our, in, in our, um, in our uh, eligibility framework. So this includes studies of Dr. For, of Dr. Cog eligible projects that, uh, that cross county boundaries. So really those larger, like, you know, NEPA type projects that, um, that we felt uh, definitely should be eligible for the regional share. So that, yes, sir. Director okay. Brockett. Thank you. Could I interject a question here? Yes, sir. So, uh, so the uh, each subregion is allowed to propose two projects, right? And so, some of the things that might get proposed could be smaller, um, it, like uh, conceivably, I mean, railroad grade separations can be hard, but they could be easier too. W would you be allowed to group a few together as one submittal, or would it, you know, or or a bicycle project that spanned a distance with some different? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I, I um. Hmm. I, I, it's a good question. I, I don't know if it's an actual, like, if, the, if you're submitting multiple corridors, probably not. But I could see a situation like, I'm th for some reason, I'm thinking like signal improvements. Mm -hmm. Like if you, you could, you know, potentially submit a collection of signal improvements within, within the county or whatever that need to be upgraded, those types of things. But... It, and I, thought, I know operational improvements are allowed. Correct. You know, and again, those could be smaller. Yes. So may, maybe that's something that the working group and staff could think about and, and come back to us with some thoughts on. No, no doubt. No, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Director Sulzman. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I just have a question, maybe you'll cover it later, uh, but you talked about the two submittals and I wondered how people's previous penalties apply to the number of submissions. So some jurisdictions have penalties from the previous TIP cycle and I'm just still not clear how those apply to the new process. Yeah, that's a tremendous question. Um, you know, we, <laughs> you know, we really we we struggle with this and the director and I have had a conversation about this before and I, I um, I, I really don't know how that's going to work at this point, to be honest with you. I'm just being frank. Um, you know, it's not something that we've taken up with at the TIP policy work group level yet, uh, but it's, it's something on the to-do list, I can guarantee it. Director Knich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sure you'd prefer to wait for a conversation later, but That's since right. the last two questions both assumed that the two project limit was fixed, I think we should not consider that as a closed subject. I really think we need to debate that. Most of these project types weren't eligible when you picked two, two project limit. I just am not sure that it's still relevant now that MRAs and other things are in this pot. So rather than answering questions assuming that is a closed issue, I think it should be a live issue and we should debate it so, at, when the time comes. And I think that's a fair observation when Director Brock had asked the question, what was going through my mind is, well, that's up to the board. But yeah, so that's a fair observation. It is. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you if, uh, if it makes some sense just to stop here now and just have a conversation about the regional share framework first before we get into the, the funding split. Um, I, we, it's up we to you all. I don't yeah, know we can certainly do that. Questions or comments at this point? Director Knich. Well, I'll just, I'll just finish the thought I started then, which is that um, I think, I mean, for, for a county like Denver, two, two doesn't really hurt us very much, but I can imagine a county like Jefferson County, we've got like multiple jurisdictions, and now you have, you know, you have six different, five or six different project types that are eligible, and to suggest that there can only be two submittals, I think that my sense, I checked in with the staff when I saw this, and their sense was that this was a lot about trying to manage a large number of applications and the staff doing a ton of scoring when there was a limited amount of funds available. So you just didn't want to waste time. But I, I think that Director Brockett made the point that you could have some smaller price tagged projects and you could still end up with a broader pool, especially now that we have, we have regional bikes as well as um, the um, operational projects and the MRAs, um, major regional arterial. So, so I, I think that I don't have a proposal, but I just think that I'd love to hear from others. But it just I, I think there's a better balance that still doesn't have the staff scoring 10 projects per county. So I, it's, I, I don't think it's 10, but I, I also don't think it's two. And, and especially I'm thinking about those of you that have multiple jurisdictions. So, Director Odorisu. I, I have a question on the last time we talked about major regional arterials we we showed a map of them uh -huh. can we show that map it, it's in your packet right. I, I'm, I'm gonna try to pull it up here let me see I know I have it in the packet I, I just remember part of the conversation was that was part of some of the major I got it. oh geez not touch screen <laughs> that's it uh, oh that's not it no do we have it pulled up Todd I think we were discussing what what it would look like with the major regional arterials and then what it would look like without. Yeah. So here's here's the freeway network. So the one that's on your screen right now and this is in your packet it's uh, attachment 1-3 figure C and um, so this is the red is the freeway network. The blue it are the capacity projects that are currently within our regional, our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. And then the, this is the MRAs or, or major regional arterials and uh, it is the gold lines that are reflected here are major regional arterials. Um, the blue that's shown here are the capacity projects that are in our long range plan. So the so capacity can only be done, be submitted on uh, the blue lines, any any other operational projects or the like can be submitted on any of the gold lines, gold and blue. Go ahead. And, and so the, is the question whether we want to add blue and gold on this map to be eligible for the bigger regional pot? Correct. That's what I thought. So with that said, I thought last time part of the conversation which piqued my interest was saying that some of these may be better applicable to sub-regional rather than the, to the big shared, you know, game-changing regional stuff that we're trying to talk about. 
And so that's kind of the, what I remember the discussion. And my recommendation would be that we don't include the major regional arterials to compete for that regional pot, given the fact that those almost seem that you can improve, be more applicable to the sub-regional allocations rather than the big one. Okay. Other questions or comments at this point? Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly, I appreciate you, your meeting with Federal Highways, and we certainly appreciate their partnership and really appreciate the letter. It really defines a few things for us. It just shows no doubt they are a player, but a decision maker, maybe not in some of the situations. But given that the, uh, in that conversation, they may have had some concerns uh, about the regional, some regional plan and the percent, was there discussion and information in them to let them know that a subregion could also submit or contribute to a regional project, therefore maybe easing some of their concerns of saying maybe there's not enough in regional. Did you have that conversation? Did you let them know that is at the perusal of a subregion? They're very aware of that, yes. And, and I think uh, I can tell you that at that specific meeting, we didn't have that conversation that I recall, but I know that Doug Rex has had that uh, very detailed conversation with them in the past. Okay, appreciate it, because I think that's a very important thing for us as we're considering the percent. No doubt yep. a subregion does have the ability to com submit, uh, excuse me, contribute to a regional project of their choice. Right. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Director, if, if I may, Please. real quick, and you're, you're correct, Director Partridge, I mean, it is an important point. And, and uh, Federal Highways, they've, they've participated in the TIP Policy Work Group, so, so they're familiar with those concepts and, and discussion, yeah. So in the queue, I have Director Dyack and Director Jones. Director Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to piggyback off of Director Brockett's uh, comments. Um, you know, to me, uh, Parker was, was, uh, had some funding for a, uh, what I would call a smaller project. I think we got $800,000 of federal funding, and um, I, was, I was very pleased. But in, from operational perspective, uh, something that small is, is very, uh, I guess, difficult operationally to, to manage. Uh, my staff indicated that, that larger amounts um, are good. So to me, I'm, I'm open to clustering projects together if, if there's a definite plan and it's along the same corridor. But I would also ask the work group to consider minimums uh, just from, a, just from a, the, the process uh, of, of organization and efficiency. Um, minimums in terms of uh, you know, project, uh, project size, uh, dollars contributed, Something like that, because to me, uh, logistically, it'd be very challenging to to give federal dollars or federalize smaller projects. It might be overwhelming for the smaller communities. Thank you, Director Jones. Um, thanks. Going back to um, some of the prior conversation about uh, number of projects, I too think it's it's not a deal breaker one way or the other, but. I do think two projects is a pretty small number, particularly for multi-jurisdictional counties where you're trying to um, look broadly across the, the expansive geography. So it seems to me at least three. I totally get that we don't want to bombard staff with too much analysis, but I think even increasing it to three would still keep it a manageable number. And I, I tend to be... A, more on the side of, of keeping a larger number of project categories eligible under regional. And so I, I would, I think, ma uh, major regional arterials make sense to include in the regional pot. And, and particularly given that, I think a higher number of projects makes more sense. Director Teal. I actually, I'm, I'm, it's going to happen again, Elise. I'm, I'm going to agree with Director Jones. <laughs> what? I know. It's uh, shocking and amazing. But no, I, I actually, I think uh, Director Jones is on to something there. I mean, I, I, I think increasing it to three, increasing the submissions from the subregion to three is certainly reasonable. Um, it still does keep the cap. I can definitely see the issue of... Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, we are paying staff, so uh, they can definitely do the yeah, work. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> and uh, but the bottom line is, um, 
I, I do think there has to be some kind of cap on it, some kind of lid on it. And, uh, and so I think it, increasing that to three, I think that's perfectly reasonable and I would support that as, a, as an option. I'd also like to double down even more with including the major, um, uh, the MRAs, the major regional arterials. Um, just from the perspective that if we do just look at our uh, freeways options, you know, uh, number one, those are enormous ticket items. Th those are enormously expensive. And therefore, I find it uh, difficult to imagine how we're actually going to cover that based on the funds that we have available. However, when we look at the MRAs and the gold and the blue, we do have quite a few opportunities there to make some um, pretty key um, improvements across the region. So, I, I, you know, from that perspective, there, I would ask that, I, I would recommend that we um, do have the MRAs included uh, in the regional pot. Just from the perspective, there's, it, I hated the phrase spreading the peanut butter there, Mr. Chairman, but I understand uh, why you brought it up this evening. Uh, if there is a consideration to uh, trying to um, take care of the, the larger, as many jurisdictions as we can, I think the MRAs might be an opportunity in our regional pot to do just that. So um, once again, um, Director Jones, we cannot tell any of our constituency that we agreed <laughs> on this subject, but I'm happy to agree with you. <laughs> oh. That's okay. Most of my constituents don't read your Facebook page. I think I'm the only one, as a matter of fact. I think I might be it. So it's okay. It's fine. So two quick comments. One is um, I, I may have heard, misheard Director Dyack or, or Director Teal, but I just wanted to clarify that I think that when Director Dyack was talking about staff, he wasn't referring to Dr. Cog's staff. He was referring to Parker's staff. And one of the conversations that, that uh, John and I had was, how uh, more challenging it is for smaller municipalities that have very small staffs to, you know, when, when they federalize a project and all the paperwork and everything that goes with it, you know, a staff of, of a city the size of Aurora has a little easier time handling that than, than you know, maybe Bennett or somebody else. Um, the, and I didn't mean to pick on you, Mr. Venom, but um, the, other, the other thing that I wanted to mention was when we're talking about the projects, I think that we have to keep in mind that the whole idea of these, of the tip money is that it's the final amount of money that pushes it past the tipping point and hopefully the majority of the money is already in place through other funds and I know that we've talked about that but you know this money is supposed to be the final amount that makes it a viable project. So other questions or comments? I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, last one yet. Yes. I, I guess I want to speak a little bit to the perception that small communities can't handle large projects. Um, Lyons is a community of 2,000 people, and we're in the process of spending $70 million in flood recovery, federal money, most of that. Um, and I, the, one of the reasons I like this approach is because it actually does really help support the small communities with federal large projects. The reason we've been successful with our flood recovery is because of the Boulder County Collaborative and working in a very similar way to make sure that we can manage those funds. So um, I don't want to, I, I would hate to see this group say, well, let's not fund these large projects in small communities because we have major highways that flow through our town um, and we need major improvements to a lot of these highways. So these projects can be really important for our community and for the, re the region because you can't get to Rocky Mountain National Park without going through Lyons. <laughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice tonight. <clears throat> so I just think um, there are ways to mobilize and work together as a community and uh, make sure these projects are successfully managed. We did actually complete a large TIP project in the last cycle on our Main Street. So um, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. No, I, I misspoke if that's what you heard me say. I apologize. What I was referring to is sometimes smaller communities have a more difficult time managing the smaller projects, not the larger projects. So, but if I could have could be totally wrong. I I'm, I'm, don't come from one of the smaller communities. I, I think we do okay with either one. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Other questions or comments? All right. Uh, I'm sorry, Director Kanich. 
Thanks. Um, before we leave this um, section, the, in this section was also the recommendation that projects with the choices A or B. Oh, yes. So, Mr. Chair, I just didn't know when you wanted to take up getting thoughts on, on that option. If you're going to, if you want to do it now and close this section out. Let's do, yes. Yeah. So, so I guess, and, and, and I thought it might be helpful. I thought you guys included a really good attachment three in the packet, which is, I guess, page 38. I found it very telling that like three projects out of the entire tip cycle were less than 50%. So I thought, I mean, the vast 90% of the projects we funded would not be able to be funded under option one. So just an observation. Okay. Anything further? All right, Mr. X. Oh, wait. Oh. Are we done discussing this section? Because I have a, I'll jump in. Uh, if if there's more discussion on this, please, Director Jones. Well, I guess I, I sort of feel like option one or option two is sort of like term limits. Why would we take away the board's prerogative to make a decision that we want to spend more on a particularly worthwhile project? I think since the decisions come back to the board, we should reserve that opportunity for ourselves. I think um, Director Kanich points out some good statistics on the fact that we often want to be able to invest more money in a project. So I would favor option two. And if we need to say that include language that around the evaluation process will, you know, appreciate larger matches or smaller uh, contributions from Dr. Cog, great. But I wouldn't put it as eligibility criteria. Okay. Director Shaw. I think I just wanted to clarify um, if option one is capped at at 20 million, we're talking about the Dr. Cog portion of it, right? Correct. Yes. Because I I'm not seeing figures adding up to 50 percent. I am I missing? If I may, Mr. Chair, on, on yes. attachment three, the percentage of Dr. Cog funds is 80%, 50, 80, 80, 37, oh, 80, 80. You're doing 53. the percentage. Right. Got it. So, so it's not the dollar cap that would have okay. knocked out a lot of these projects, it's the percentage cap. Thank you. Director Perkins Smith. I'd just like to comment on option well, one as well. Um, what you might see, um, CDOT has certain requirements in terms of what we can do for projects in-house. And so sometimes what you see, if you have that requirement that it can't exceed 50%, in order to hit that 50%, you may shorten a project, you may cut it in half. So now it means you have to come back the next time and ask for the second part of it. Um, it is not an efficient use of your funds because you've had to mobilize twice. So I thought I'd just make that comment if you want to think about that. Director Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, regarding option one, I, I first looked at it, I thought 50% might be too generous, um, just looking at it, and then I saw the uh, list of projects. Um, you know, again, going back to the regional pot, you know, I, I assume the regional share is going to transformative projects. That's a term we used before. Uh, and with, with that being said, um, you know, the, the funding world for projects is changing. And uh, you no longer can kind of come to entities like, like Dr. Cog or CDOT and say, uh, give me 90% or 100% of a project. Um, you know, I, I hear stories all the time, especially from uh, my, my county commissioner to the left of me. Uh, we have to work together to put in money and to uh, do everything we can in order to, to liberate funds from CDOT, from Dr. Cog, from, from the federal government. So to me, I, I think this is a, a step as to where the funding of projects is going. So uh, to me, I, I take the TIP Working Group's option one as, as the one I would advocate for. Director Zabel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I'm just looking down on attachment three and our, I, I saw three projects that I pointed out. None of them would have gotten funded under that scenario of 50% because they're all at 80% or we de or we do only um, three quarters of the project and that would be silly. 
Um, I think we need to make it a, a way where we can, and it's only about thirty-two, thirty-three thousand dollars, all three of those, to make it. It's not a lot of money to make it where we can make sure we are fully finishing projects as opposed to coming in the next year, you know, doing half of it, tying up the roads. This is, uh, most of these are on major arterials, Wadsworth Boulevard, where the traffic is horrendous anyway in those areas. So I, I think we just, we, we got to make it, make it work so that we're actually funding, let's finish projects. Isn't that what we want to do? We don't want to hold them half open mm -hmm. and, and do that. So that's my two cents. Director Shaw. I wondered if there is perhaps an appetite for keeping the $20 million cap and um, giving bonus points for high participation at a local or sub-regional level um, that might encourage municipalities and counties to come together. Thoughts? Director Partridge. Not to say you have a, a thought regarding the, the, the question raised, but uh, I agree with uh, Director Dyack on transformational projects. I think that's a very key thing that we bring up. I heard the suggestion of moving two projects per uh, subregion to three. Not that I can, I really not concern one way or the other because there's only going to be so many regional projects allowed regardless there's only a certain pocket, uh, pot of money but I would say if we're going to look at raising that to three or even considering that two projects when we look at either option one or option two I have to say I'm not in favor of option two but I would consider if uh, take us under have it con under consideration if we're going to raise it to three that max may be lower down to say 15 million because you're really limiting yourself on a number of pro regional projects and we all know nowadays any way you get a project done is partnerships so it is a requirement that is what we're seeing that's how we get things done we all know that so it just it also gives that impetus for partnership to occur but if it's too high less chance of partner partnership but as uh, in our meeting with CDOT today, that was emphasized over and over again, the partnership. So I would suggest that we lower option one down to 15 million, especially if we're looking at three projects per region, per subregion. Okay, in the queue, I have Director Baker, Teal, and Brockett. Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, looking at attachment three, um, I just am noticing noticing that the column on the right, the Dr. Cog funds, that those are not the total project cost. Those are the percentage that Dr. Cog funds. Mm -hmm. um, and most of those projects, um, as I understand it, were scored and they, they had to provide a match. They were not the last in money, last in. And I think that option one does in fact continue that um, history of um, being the last money in to finish the project and um, kind of be the closer for that project. So. Director Teal. Uh, question for the executive director with a follow-up statement, if I may, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Doug, um, so we're going through option one and option two right now, trying to come to a consensus. However, this is still under the assumption that um, CDOT Central 70 uh, commitment for 25 million should be included as the regional share allocation. Correct. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, so um, John and I are from neighboring uh, municipalities. So um, we tend to talk uh, a bunch. We see each other around the county. We tend to talk a bunch. And uh, every, t every now and again, he says something that makes me kind of do a headbutt and go, oh, yeah, that's, that's 
probably part of the key thing that we should be focusing on. And he just said it a few moments ago when he reminded um, myself, and I hope you guys too, the intent of these regional projects are that they are transformational. They are game changers. They are something that is going to either significantly alleviate an issue we have, or they're an issue that are going to significantly you know, take us on a next step of improvement. And so I, too, support the idea of option number one. Um, I think there's still some room there to discuss where we should cap it in terms of the dollar amount. But I, I, would, I would suggest that we, we want to go with option one on this one, guys. You know, we, um, again, I hate the phrase spreading the, spreading the peanut butter, but, you know, the regional area, it's not the place to be spreading the peanut butter. It's the place to be allocating funds that are going to need to do something significant at a regional level. For all of us that took an hour and a half to drive in today. <laughs> of course, a lot of you don't live as far out as, uh, as I do. You know, <laughs> okay, very good. Um, but the bottom line is, is that's what we want these regional projects for. When we start talking about the sub-regionals, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel very confident that as Douglas County, we can come together, we can get our sub-regionals figured out, and we can come up with good uh, projects that will be adherent to uh, FHA's uh, big concerns, okay? We will toe the line in terms of eligibility. But yeah, I, I'm kind of going with option one here. Again, we are wanting those transformational projects. And even when we get away from Central 70, which will be huge for the Denver region. Once we get away from that, you know, we still want option one in place because we want those projects, regardless of which grouping they come out of, to really be game changers, to really be something that um, we're going to be able to justify to all of our constituencies. Director Brockett. <coughs> I think Director Shaw was on to something there. I think that's a, a reasonable compromise would be to uh, give us the flexibility to fund something over 50%, uh, but prioritize and score projects that ask for a smaller match higher while retaining a dollar cap. I mean, the fact is, is that we don't have an enormous amount of money to work with. You know, going with that 3070 that we're, that we're using to, to set this conversation, um, it gives us uh, if I'm reading the numbers correctly, 69 million for the regional share with 25 million taken off for Central 70. That's 44 million left. It, I mean, that's, if we allowed more than 20 million, that could be two projects. You know, so, um, you know, the, and while we want them to be transformational, I think we also want some flexibility to make some targeted improvements in maybe some smaller projects that could have a real regional impact um, if you do it in just the right place. So I think giving us some flexibility but still capping the dollar amount is a good approach. So real quick, just a uh, logistical thing. Um, this might be self-explanatory, but wherever we end up at the conversation tonight, if we, uh, of course, we're not taking any action tonight, but if we feel like we're comfortable that this will go to the board at our next January board meeting, that's what will happen. If we're not to the point that people feel it's that we're comfortable taking it to the board for a vote, then we will have this continued topic at the January 3rd work session, just so everybody's aware of the logistics. Any other conversation on these items? Director Grape. Bah humbug, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Sorry, that was my attempt at levity because we are very close to the holiday over here. Uh, actually, just... Uh, Sorry, just over on this side. <laughs> or Bob Cratchit over here. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Actually, one other quick thing while we're talking and people are laughing and having fun. There, the earlier characterization about this polarizing conversation, I think it's a really healthy conversation. I think we've had some great dialogue. I don't really see it as polarizing. I really see like 58 tiny reindeer trying to pull a sleigh, <laughs> right? And all the reindeer are sometimes trying to get go forward. Or everybody's trying to go forward, but we're trying to go in slightly different directions. But hopefully the reindeer will come together so the toys can get delivered uh, for Christmas Eve, okay? So <laughs> just one quick note on option two and a, a quick note about the 7030. So for option two, I, I think that 
wherever we can bring in flexibility for this group as we're doing planning for the future of this region, I think it's critically important, right? We are really trying to lay a foundation for the future need of our region, much of which we may not fully understand as of yet. And so especially since we're making these large changes uh, to our structure and the way that we're going to allocate funding, I think we need to allow ourselves as much flexibility as possible to navigate the, the future opportunities that may present themselves. So I think option two is a much better uh, choice for us, uh, given the unknowns that the future may hold. Uh, concerning the 70-30 the split, and Mr. Chairman, is it okay to say a note here, or would you prefer I hold my comments for? I would prefer that we wait for that yes, sir. fuller conversation. So I just, just as long as I'm... Thank you, and Merry Christmas, everyone. I, I'm, I'm keeping track uh, of my foibles tonight. So I inadvertently uh, uh, made a derogatory comment about small <laughs> communities. People don't like peanut butter. And, and now people don't like my polarizing comment. So I'll just keep a, a running track of, of the things that I'm doing wrong tonight. Director Zabo. Well, and I agree with Santa Graves that we need to, that we do need to, especially with the, the, this change, to be flexible. Because down the line, we can change again, can't we? Is this on tablets that... You can't it is not. rewrite, or can you backspace a little bit and, and make some changes at one point? And so I think to start out with flexibility, and then as things go on, then you tighten it up, uh, is just my, my opinion. Director Gu Wang. Thank you. I have a lot of good, 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 good. Love good. peanut butter. Um, so I agree with the last two comments. Um, and I think that it makes sense to me to keep the flexibility because looking at the, again, in attachment three, the large majority of these projects wouldn't be able to get funded. And so making such an enormous change in the process seems not smart to me. Thank you. Director Odoricio. I guess, the, I think it makes sense what you're saying and what a, f a few folks have said is some of these projects may not have been eligible in the prior regional pot, but what we're talking about doing is a lot of those projects would have been funded through the sub-regional pot. And so I think what I'm concerned about with the option one or option two, and I, I do think we kind of have a little bit of polarization on the options one and option two. Maybe there's some more flexibility in option one I would personally support. But the, the issue is that when you are now trying to do a pilot program where we have more of a sub-regional approach, what is in the regional pot and what is eligible for the regional pot really should be the very larger transformational things that everyone can agree on. Um, and then those other things that might make more sense be uh, funded through the sub-regional thing, uh, th through the sub-regional pot. So for me, I like option one. I'm okay. Personally, I think we're a little bit more flexible on that. But if you go with option two, what you stand uh, to risk is that you're going to have a smaller amount of big projects gobbling up everything out of that regional pot. And that's why option one still provides a level of, of gamesmanship for people to still get a fair shot at um, the regional pot eligibility. So I, I think option one makes more sense. Thank you. <laughs> Director Elrod. Uh, one of the things to consider when we look at putting, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. When you're putting, um, whether it's caps or minimums or a percentage, you, in essence, are already creating the criteria. And by, by default, you are removing that flexibility. Um, given that there's 58 reindeers, to me that says we probably do a really good job um, holding ourselves accountable and regulating ourselves. And again, with the point of these being transformation projects, it would be okay if it was just one or two. It doesn't have to be ten if, if we really want to think about transformation. So it's, to me, it's about the quality and impact, not the number of projects that we should be measuring here. Thank you. Director Partridge and then Director Dyack. Uh, Mr. Chairman, since you're on a, a roll with <laughs> faux pas tonight, 
I'm just going to throw this out to my friends in Adam County. You probably don't want to mention horse trading. Just give you an idea. Yeah, he doesn't understand. Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Andrew, that, right, that, that takes us back. It was a great time. So more levity. <laughs> just watching your backside there, guy. <laughs> Director uh, Dyack. No, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not, no, not, oh, I thought that was it. That I, that was editorial it. comment. <laughs> I thought that was the whole thing. something of substance. <laughs> Continue. A couple of things. Uh, back to the uh, the option. Just to make a comment and even make it personal to uh, what we see at Douglas County. No doubt you have to be on the long range plan for your projects. And truly we weren't, and I would you could call these regional sub -re major sub regional projects C470 and I25 South. C470. We didn't have to worry about any type of a maximum cap. It received no Dr. Cog funding. And, it, and kudos to CDOT for really working with federal and locals to leverage funds to be able to get that project. But again, that is a major road. C-470, no Dr. Cog money. I-25 South, right now, no Dr. Cog money. So looking at two major projects, so that's why I'm going to lobby again, option one, but at a lower cap, more projects, maybe it gives us better option. Uh, last thing is just on attachment three, uh, Executive Director Rex, would you agree that when you really look at the majority for attachment three, would you really say that these are sub-regional projects to really, <laughs> ah, ah, I'm looking for a concurrence. Wow. Here. Yeah, because when you really no, look at these, that. It, it's pretty minimal when you really think about it. I just want to make that point, see if he, maybe I <laughs> concur with you or not, but to put you on the spot. I think they're important projects. <laughs> <laughs> That's not it. It wasn't a multiple choice. Yeah, I take that as a yes, as a concur. <laughs> <laughs> Director Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, Again, uh, regardless, option one, option two, uh, I just want to re-echo uh, Director Shaw's point of uh, uh, points uh, in, the, in the narrative that was in the packet. There's a regional share evaluation process that's, that's called out. Um, I, I assume it's some sort of subjective scoring sheet process. I would sort of re-echo that uh, I would want to highly reward projects with, with uh, that, that provide more funding uh, greater funding and less Dr. Cog funding, because to me, I'm a big advocate of Dr. Cog money being last dollar in. So to me, I think that's a critical part of, of any option. Waiting. Anything else? All right. Mr. Rex. Okay. So that was good discussion. I'm not sure if I got direction. But, um, but I, well, I don't, uh, I guess I take it that we're not giving direction tonight. This would be something that, um, you know, assuming that the board feels like we've had a robust enough conversation that we understand people's um, take on things, we understand the logic that people are using to support what they are, what they are advocating, then when we get to the board, um, the actual board meeting in January, it's going to be a matter of somebody making a motion and, and supporting that motion and getting a second and having a vote. Um, so I, I guess that's what I'm thinking is that we're not actually not there looking for direction right. or Got looking it. to give staff direction. Is, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. okay. Great. Oh. Uh, Director Vidum. Will there be an opportunity to uh, discuss the central issue tonight? The Allocation of uh, regional, sub-regional funds? Yep. Funny you should mention it. <laughs> well, here we go. Well, I um, had a few slides on this. I, what I thought I might do real quick, though, because I have a few slides on Puget Sound. We had them in a, in a past packet, and then we never, ever got to them, because it is related to this discussion, obviously. And it, quite frankly, it's, it's related to um, 
the discussion we just had about the options as well. So I, I, real quick, let me just go through these. Um, they have focus areas like we do. As you all know, I think I've said this, that you know, the Seattle area, the Puget Sound model is what we're using is kind of our model. Um, and um, you know, they basically have, have focus areas. They really you know, try to center their projects, concentrate their projects around corridors that they have within, within their region. Um, that's really where the, their eligibility of projects reside. Um, they do have set aside, similar to us, similar but not similar, in that they have a preservation pilot. They have money set aside, 20% set aside of SCP funds for the preservation of their existing system. They have a 10% bicycle and pedestrian uh, set aside, and they have a rural town center and corridors program um, of $3 million. Now, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a little weird how they do their calculation on this, but um, basically, in their in their documentation, they talk about a 50-50 split, but uh, but the effective rate is not 50-50 because the um, uh, the the preservation pilot and the bicycle pedestrian set asides they get wrapped back in around into the re sub-regional share, so they get their proportion and amount for each gets wrapped back in. So as a result, their their true rate is really 65-35 is what is what they use in. Um, in uh, uh, in Puget Sound, the uh, the other set aside that's mentioned, the the rural town centers, they do a separate call for that, um, so that's not part of their uh, their big call, let's say. Um, other notes of significance on on theirs is uh, they, they, like I suggested, that, you know earlier, you know their regional projects are submitted by the sub regional forums, uh, so each sub they have four counties, um, uh, they actually allow submittals much higher than what anything we're talking about here. King County being the largest is eligible to submit 12 and then the other three counties are six. Sound Transit can submit two and uh, the DOT can submit two as well. So just, just so you all know. Um, and then on the sub-regional projects, each, sub, each form is responsible for the selection program as, uh, as uh, we're suggesting ours would be too. So there's a lot here that you'll see that you can be very familiar with and I think that's it. So I'm going to go back here a few slides and um, talk about the regional split. I know we've waited long enough for this discussion um, that uh, the TIP Policy Work Group, and this came, I think it's probably June work session meeting, uh, presented a, uh, a proposal to you all in that the minimum share for the subregion would be 70 percent. And the concept associated with that would be that, you know, in order to run this whole new process that we're talking about, there had to be at least, you know, there had to be a significant amount of money in that re sub-regional pot in order for it to make sense. So, uh, so what was uh, proposed was a minimum of 70 percent and a maximum share in the regional pot of 30 percent. And as the chairman suggested, um, in conversations we've had with FHWA, um, they are not going to dictate what the, uh, what the percentage split is. And I think the, the chairman did a good job of explaining or articulating FHWA's position is that this is a pilot to them and they do, you know, the only, you know, a, and you have the letter um, that, that they provided to us um, and it really speaks to, you know, the transparency of the process and all that which will definitely make sure we do so. But they uh, do believe that there should be enough monies, whatever that means, in the regional pot to have a discussion about these larger regional projects. So, um, so uh, the last, last but not least, the last bullet on here is the TIP Policy Work Group. Um, in our, our previous meetings leading up to this, suggested that we provide you all with, uh, with three scenarios, funding scenarios, and those are uh, 25, or 3565, 3070, and uh, 35, what was that, 2575. Um, so just so you have some understanding of the incremental change between those, um, particularly to the subregions, it's not really that much um, in relative terms, but, um, but I think it was useful to have those three scenarios so you can have a discussion this evening. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I won't go through those scenarios, but I will turn it back to you. Director Zabel. Uh, Mr. X, I have a quick question about Puget Sound and their structure of funding transportation statewide. Is it similar to ours? Is there no general fund dollars from the state that goes to transportation? It's is a good question. I, 
well, you know, we don't we don't have a whole lot of state money at all. I know. You know, within here, our state, so we're different in that respect for sure. Um, I don't know, Deb. I don't know if you would know more than I. I I'm not sure. I'm not either. I don't I'm think you're saying is, is, is it similar? Because we're going off of yeah. for the Dr. Cog dollars. Is the rest of it similar? I I believe so. I don't think okay. that like California where they get like by statute they get additional monies to the, to the regions. Um, so I think it's it's similar in that respect. Yeah. Oh, I will say that um, Todd and I looked at some of the regional projects that were selected last time, and it was interesting to see. Um, they don't have a cap on their, their funding requests, but they never funded anything over $13 million, which I thought was interesting. And, that, and there was projects in which they funded that um, uh, they, they, they funded at a less amount than what was requested. So I would suggest that you know, part of their selection criteria, and this is something we're going to have for the further conversations with Puget Sound about, that they may, may have had some concept about scalability of projects so that, you know, if you don't get the full amount, can you do with a certain other amount? So just, just FYI. Thank you, sir. I'm done. Director Odorisu. Go back to the previous slide real quick. Yeah. So um, I learned since the last meeting we had that 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 the TIP policy work group, that what you're saying on that slide I think is more clear than what we had last time, right? Is that the TIP policy work group, and maybe it didn't change, but maybe it didn't sink in. I'm kind of slow sometimes, <laughs> okay. But that, that that's a minimum recommendation, Correct. is that the 70 was a minimum. There is There was no recommended cap, right? So oh, no. really the range of what the TIP policy working group is really for the subregion is 70 to 100, which I'm not, before Elise <laughs> throws a pen at me, I'm not recommending that. Uh, I'm not recommending 100, but what I'm saying is like, w what the range that we are really talking about based on the TIP policy work group is really 70 to 100, knowing that not a lot of people agree with 100, not even I would, I mean. But then why is staff presenting 35, 65, 70, 30, and 75, 25? I mean, it seems like we're pushing the staff and executive board tonight is pushing the 70-30 when really the discussion from TIP policy work group is that was just the minimum floor, not necessarily what TIP policy working group was really focused on. It seems kind of like we're, we're kind of nudging to the 70-30, right. but really it was just the minimum floor, right? Right, right. Well, as, as the slide suggests up here, I mean, that was directed by the TIP policy work group to provide you with those three options. We're setting, I guess, the curbs around that 70-30 proposal. Right, um, that was was directed by the tip policy work group. Director Jones. Well, I was just going to say there's a couple of things. One is if we're using Puget Sound as a model, which we have been, they were 65-35, and that I think is part of the impetus of looking at that range. And while I think the, the chairman and, and um, Doug have, have are outlined the stance that Federal Highways has on this, um, they're not going to dictate, but 70-30 makes them nervous. And 90-10, I don't know if the head exploded, but let's just say there are some concerns there. So that's another reason that separate from just the TIP working group, folks are saying, well, we should l look at uh, some options that fit within, okay, we're, d we're taking a new pilot project approach. We're kind of modeling it off of somebody that, w that took a more conservative number than we did, and the Federal Highway Administration is nervous too. So for those reasons, I think a lot of people are nudging at 70-30 as the prudent course of action taking into account the good work of the TIP working group as well. So in the queue, I have Director Brockett, then Director Odoricio, and then Director Vidum. Director Brockett. So Doug, just to clarify our understanding about the TIP policy working group, so their original proposal was the minimum 70, maximum 30. Correct. But they revisited the question since our last meeting, correct? Revisited. Well, so this latest thing where you said they, the working group directed staff to provide the three funding scenarios. Right. That, that was for that, our, just for discussion for you all. To right. Me. But I mean, was that since our last discussion of, of this question as a it board? It was. Yeah. So that's what I meant by revisited. Yes. That they discussed it again. Since, and so that 
And are they making a recommendation per se on the? I, I wouldn't call it that, Director Brockett. I, I would suggest that this was, um, you know, and this was these were negotiated numbers within our group too, right? Uh, you know, there were some that felt, as I suggested, that the, there was a minimum of seventy that was needed in order to, to establish this process because of the work required and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and clearly, there were those that felt that the there were uh, the regional pot should be larger than smaller. Um, you know, so this was kind of this, and I would suggest there are plenty on that group that feel that it should be larger than 70. Um, there are several on that group that feel it should be higher than 30 in the regional pot. You know what I mean? So this is, this is what came out of that group, that the minimum they felt comfortable working with was 70. Although I'm sure there, I know there are, there are those on that committee that would like it to be more. Okay. Thank you. Director Odoricio. Um, did and, and what we're referring to then, just for clarification, is this letter from from the Department of Transportation, right? Because I didn't read any head exploding in here. Like, are they? Can do we have people here from the group from the Department of Transportation that can tell us what their concerns might be, or what they think are reasonable ranges? Because that's that's what I'm hearing from colleagues is that we're worried about what their thoughts are, and I think it's fair to ask them if they're willing to. Because if, if we're worried that, that they're that concerned, let's hear it from them. Because I'm not seeing it in this letter. Sure. Um, Bill, I don't know how comfortable you are. Hi, uh, Bill Haas, Federal Highway Administration, Colorado Division Office. Um, I'd refer you to bullet point two. We will not come out and prescribe a percentage. But we will also say it's a limited amount of money, and you have a lot of needs. So you put the money in the best projects, whether they're regional or sub-regional. So we'll leave it at that. So I don't think you guys want us to come in, give you a percentage. I really don't. So I'll leave it at that. Director Vidum. So uh, let me begin here. Um, people that have uh, substantially more experience in these matters than I do, people that have been through a TIP fund allocations in years past have uh, suggested to me that uh, small communities rarely fare well in these matters. So uh, from the earliest point, uh, we have always uh, believed that um, a 80-20 uh, allocation would be better uh, for small communities than a 70-30 allocation. Um, so if, if in fact uh, the final outcome is 70-30, uh, I probably uh, won't call suicide prevention. I mean, like, <laughs> we can live with this. Okay. Uh, at the uh, November work study uh, meeting, I uh, hurled out an anchor with the hope that that anchor would hold some position for smaller communities. That we, it wouldn't be a total wipeout. Okay, so my, my proposal that night was, no matter how the uh, uh, regional, sub-regional brouhaha, you know, finally was resolved, the 10% of the sub-regional money would be reserved for communities with a population of 20,000 people or less. Okay, so I'm, I'm not pulling my anchor up. I am still uh, speaking on behalf of that, that uh, smaller communities such as the town of Bennett with 2,500 people are, are going to come away from this uh, complete experience with some positive sensation. Uh, let, me just, let me just say one uh, uh, concluding remark. In the last 12 months, the town of Bennett repaved 92% of our roads. Now we went out and we looked for funding of uh, federal, state, county, anything, and we got, we came up with zero. Okay, so we repaved our own roads with our own money. We had no support. Okay, so in this process, this this, that we are grinding the gears on here, I am in strong hope that there will be some crumb for smaller communities. 
Thank you for uh, considering my thoughts. Thank you. In the queue, I have Director Teal and Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, um, I'm. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I, I f didn't get your name. Bill. Thank you very. Thank you, Bill, for coming forward and speaking. And I mean, uh, thank you for helping to clarify a little bit of what the real rules are, what the real expectation is, versus some of the um, conversations that have occurred. I mean, it's it's made clear in the position paper here by from. Uh, FHWA that you know what's going to be more important is that we adhere to our selection criteria and then we adhere to the the reporting and the transparency that FHWA is going to demand of regional projects as well I mean that's what I'm reading as I'm trying to get through this so it, I think we need to set a we need to take the, the comments at face value that FHWA is not going to uh, uh, dictate at that percentage split and the reality is is they just want us to be accountable for whatever we decide to do and I think we already want to be accountable for whatever we decide to do and the bottom line is is even if we go through this process and we do go into those sub-regional forums guys that's okay. We're we're still a part of that sub-regional process at our sub-regions. Um, in many ways, it's uh, uh, I, I will refer. I, I won't name her, but uh, once again, referring to another director, when she one time told me the difference of being a, a council person in a municipality and to get a vote passed, I got to go one, two, three, four. Okay, it's passed. And she pointed out that at a uh, uh, county level. It's one, two. <laughs> well, if we're making decisions at a regional level, we're advocating for our own projects or we're helping a friend out to advocate. We're counting one, two, three, four, five. How high county? Help me out here. Uh, Thir about, 32. about 20, 30, 40 possible <laughs> votes in order to get our option on the table. Whereas if you're in the sub-regional, well, guys, you know, you can look around and you can see who's in your county. You know that that doesn't count up to be 30. It doesn't count up to be 20. So um, I, I think I, I think th I think we we take the letter from FHWA. We take the statements we heard from Bill this evening. We proceed on that course of action. With that said, I too would like to advocate actually and get outside the box of our three scenarios. And, and like us to consider the 80-20 split. It does give us that capability to, within the subregions, take care of our smaller communities. And oh, by the way, as when I look at the list of uh, communities here in Dr. Cog, uh, Castle Rock doesn't seem to fit into that anymore. So um, that's something that uh, I don't get to count myself in on. But I think we should be robust in how we allocate to the subregions. We all must follow the same rules. We all must be accountable to the region, to the entire body here. But I think we should be thinking about being more robust beyond the 70-30. Understanding entirely that the model we are following, great. I lived in Puget Sound uh, my last three years in the Army. It was a gorgeous place. I loved it. I couldn't get a job there with a, as a janitor without a master's degree. They're them. We're us. We can make these decisions on our own. So even though we don't have a good model up, unless, of course, Doug, you brought the uh, interactive uh, play at home version like you did at the work session, uh, I too would actually, I'd like to start at thinking in terms of going with an 80-20 split, 80 to the subregions, 20 to the region. Director Baker. Director Teal Ua. Um, <laughs> Director Vidum expressed some uh, that I think uh, some feelings about the smaller communities that belong to Dr. Cog that I think is prevalent. And as I reported to this group the last time we had this discussion, the initial meetings of our sub-regional forum were at 90% um, sub-regional, 10% regional. Just for that fact that they see a glimmer of hope and 
so I went back and I expressed some of the opposition that I heard to the to the uh, that um, 1090 split and so we as a group uh, did advocate for the uh, 2080 so with 20% regional and 80% sub-regional I have to make sure I get those right that that but so we're at the same place that you are in the in the queue I have director Atchison Graves and Dick director Atchison we've had a lot of discussion back tonight and a lot of stuff has come up that has not been discussed previously in this uh, we are at three minutes to what we typically call a time and I asked Doug if there is a drop dead that has to have a decision to give to the board tonight the answer is no what I would recommend you consider is think about all the conversations that have been here tonight and then let us continue this I don't think we are ready to end it I think there's some thoughts that have been brought up tonight that had not been discussed before I don't think anybody is ready to make a final recommendation where a majority of people are in the same place regardless of what the split is but I would recommend to you to take the thoughts that were expressed tonight give us some more thought and let's continue this discussion at the January meeting because we're not bound by a time limit tonight other than it's getting late a lot of stuff's been brought up we can certainly continue this conversation because there's not a deadline on making that decision tonight I do want to mention that um, although some meetings in the past we have had a hard stop at 830 that's actually not the case tonight so um, you know I I appreciate director Atchison's comments and we can we can do whatever pleases the board as far as coming back on January 3rd with these thoughts in mind and continuing the conversation or uh, go a little bit further tonight uh, I have directors graves dick and Brockett director graves thank you mr. chairman uh, just a quick thought to share about our our process for making this new decision and and changing the way that we administer uh, funds for this organization if you just put the percentages aside for a moment there's there are clearly a lot of opinions around the table about where we should end up I have a process concern about you know making a, uh, a significant change in our process and not doing it in a very conservative and methodical manner one of the reasons that I've been quite vocal about such a large sub-regional plot each uh, sub-regional share even at like 70 percent versus 30 uh, concerning instead of like a 60 40 or something of that nature I feel that we should walk before we run I think that if we start off with a, a much closer split then over time if we like the results we like the way that it's being administered there's a feeling of equity at the table and and fairness around the region right and we feel we can do more then we can start to ratchet that up over time but I think to look at 70-30 or 80-20, I, I don't know that that is the appropriate pace for an organization of this size to make such a sea change in the way that we administer our funding policy. Thank you. Director Dick. Thank you, and thank you uh, <clears throat> Mr. Graves. <clears throat> One of the things we don't have is a lot of time our population is going to explode our travel demands are going to be much greater not for me for you I'm not going to be here <laughs> don't have to worry about that Merry Christmas I do want to <laughs> <clears throat> it's okay I, w I just won't be here that long but regardless I would like to commend Bennett for, for their remarks we're a small village and we're about four times your size we're still a small village and our hope for getting funds resources are about as close to zero as yours are if it wasn't for our neighbors we wouldn't get any it's just a fact of life so I do appreciate very much I would like for people to think about that because there are a lot more small communities than there are large ones. I thank you very much. Have a wonderful Christmas.
So in the queue, I have uh, Brockett, Stolzman, and Gutwein. Uh, Director Brockett. Well, I'll, I'll just start by supporting Director Atchison's uh, suggestion that we come back in January, because I, I think this is familiar ground we're treading, and I think we still have the uh, disagreements that we've had in the past. So maybe we come back and, and maybe it, the, and, and spend more time on it then. But I have to get in one, one quick point, even having said that, uh, which <laughs> just can't resist. Just that, the, that if you do the 80-20 uh, after you take the I-70 uh, allocation uh, out, you're at 21 million for the regional. Just put that number out there. Director Stolzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the best thing that we can do with our very limited funding in our region is to fund the most impactful projects. I have thought that at all the previous meetings also. Despite the really good conversations that we've had, I still feel that same way. I think that we can do much more for the citizens of Louisville, if I'm just thinking about myself selfishly, if we improve the operations on, say, 270, or if we improve 225. Um, that will help the people of Louisville with safety much more significantly, time saved much more significantly, our air quality will be more improved, and it will be much more cost effective than if you fund any project in Louisville. Those areas are not in my jurisdiction, but I would advocate to fund those projects because those will help the people in my city the very most. I come from a small community, and we did not get any funding in the last HIP cycle, even with the generous dedicated pool that was set aside for small communities. Even though our projects weren't chosen, we supported the option that was ultimately chosen. It was because it had many projects that have a large impact on people in our community's lives and daily activities, even though they were outside of our boundaries. I do think all of the projects that we will submit from every single one of our communities are good projects. I think they're quality projects, and they will help people's lives. So I don't think that we run the risk, really, of funding bad projects with any of these scenarios. We're going to fund good things. Uh, but I think that I would be much more confident in this new process and ensuring that we're spending this very limited pool of money effectively if we were somewhere much closer to, like, a 50-50 split. Uh, I just think that gives us the best chance of trying to fund projects that have the biggest impact on most of our citizens' lives. Thanks. Director Gouin. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. Um, so when we talked about the priorities early on, and one of the top ones was improving mobility for vulnerable populations, um, could you explain to me, since I'm new um how, are those will we measure that or is that can taken into consideration when you evaluate the different projects like how many people are impacted and how it improves mobility for, for vulnerable populations no very good question um we won't be measuring people per se i mean we um we have a map you know as defined by environmental justice it's, it's basically um it's it's minority populations and low-income populations, and we have those maps. So there will be a layer of mapping associated, and if you have projects that are adjacent to or will, will ultimately assist in those, the mobility of those communities within those sections throughout, throughout our region, then, uh, then yes, we will look upon that favorably. And, I, I can, and then I can show you um, the latest version of that, of, of that map so, so that you know. So they would be kind of ranked higher if they impact vulnerable populations. Correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Director Atchison made a suggestion. It sounds like there was at least some support for that, um, unless other people want to weigh in on the topic further, which is more than more than uh, your you can do that for certainly so I will look at the board for the will of the overall whether or not we want to adjourn director Rakowski I would support director Atchison um, so the January 3rd meeting is a work session and then we have our regular January third Wednesday January board meeting um, so I guess the question is do we want to meet for the January 3rd work session to continue this conversation or do we want to wait for the next regular scheduled board meeting I move we wait for the regular board meeting okay 
kind of, uh, is there a second for that? Motion and a second to continue this conversation to the next regularly scheduled board meeting. All those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Nay. All right. Yeah. Let's let's uh, go, uh, Director Jones. Could you just clarify whether or not um, your intention is to bring this up for a vote at the next board meeting or continue the discussion? Uh, Director Jones, I mean, it was it was staff's, I mean, it was staff's hope that we would take this for a vote in January. Director Zabel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like the extra time to have time to get with my staff um, and talk about what we've talked about tonight and, and kind of go over um, what they're thinking. That's why I think the extra time would be better. And with everybody taking their vacations and everything else during the holiday season, I think that'll be hard by the third. So I'll only comment that uh, as far as timing is concerned, we do have a call for projects. Well, um, we're going to miss that date, the, which is fine. I, I, uh, you know, I think originally we had proposed to hope we had hoped to do a call for projects, and you know, at the end of the first quarter of eighteen, that's not happening. We're looking closer at the second quarter, the end of the second quarter of uh, twenty eighteen now. So I think that's the only time sensitive issue here is, um, you know, just the comment that the further out we go the more it impacts the call for projects. Director Zabel. Will that two weeks keep us in the first quarter? No. Okay, thank you. So we had a motion and a second to continue this at the next regular board meeting. I would ask for a hand vote. All those in favor of the next regular board meeting, please raise your hand. I think that's pretty overwhelming. All those opposed? I think it's pretty, pretty significant that it will be the next regularly scheduled board meeting. So, Mr. With Chairman, if I may, is, yes, so is, is that intended to be just a discussion item at that point or, or action? I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure. I would like to see it be an action item that night, but I don't know. I, I guess the question is if we don't get to a point to take action, yeah. we just don't take action. Right. Director Kanich. I understand we aren't going to get um, clear direction directly from FHWA, but I'm looking at that bullet. So ensure regional scale projects are adequately considered. I guess I really do feel like we need a staff, a Dr. Cog staff recommendation, whether 20. So it feels to me like we're down to two proposals. We're down to 70, 30, and 80, 80. 20 as an, again a new proposal which is frustrating because the staff ran the numbers for these other proposals all of our technical staff discussed these other proposals and now we've got a new proposal that you know we don't have the numbers for in front of us that none of the technical staff got a chance to discuss so that's hard process wise that's hard but if, if we if those are the two proposals we're down to is 20 million dollars adequate for regional scale projects to be considered. I, I just, I think it's really important because I feel like we have a lot of positions about percentages going around this table and what we are not talking about is the underlying values. And so I guess that, and, I, and, I, and so I do think that you all score projects and, and, and you all are the ones that are gonna be, you know, interfacing. So, so is $20 million adequate compared to 44 million? I mean. Because that's really, I feel like, what that FHWA bullet zeroes my attention into. And, and so I guess um, that, that to me is, I, I mean, I feel like we will just continue to have this same debate unless we get a little more guidance on whether or not 20 million is adequate for, for really considering regional projects of scale and impact, which does seem to be a shared value. It seems to be a shared value about the, the level of impact but whether the $20 million allows that or whether 44 allows it better. Because I, I, it feels to me like that's almost what we're down to. So I, I don't know what that looks like, but, um, but that's, I would love a little more of a recommendation from the staff, which I know is a hard position to put you in, but I, I, I think it's hard to just do this in the blind. Sure. So. Director Shaw, then Director Teal. So I, I wondered if this might 
put a little bit of um, direction on it as well um, to Director Kanisha's comment. Um, and if we're thinking of projects in the 20-ish million dollar range, that might allow for one C dot, one RTD, and one, um, you know, sub from a sub-regional area. So that might be a um, some that I might be advocating for a 3070. But that's a different way to look at it. That it might allow us three projects rather than than two. Director Teal. Well, it's a good thing we had that motion because obviously we really want to discuss this some more. <laughs> <laughs> However, Mr. Chairman, I would move that the uh, third third week in January, our regular board meeting, that this not be a discussion item, this be an action item. If we cannot come to a consensus, obviously we can continue, but it's pretty apparent that we're under, we are under a timeline here. We, under a, we do have a stopwatch going. So uh, I would move that that actually be an action item instead of a discussion item. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second that when we reconvene for the third Wednesday regular board meeting, that this be an action item that evening. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you very much. So on that note, a uh, couple of couple of things. Again, Director Trular, thank you for your service. Uh, appreciate you being here, and uh, good luck. Director Jefferson. Oh. That's Judge wow. Jefferson to you. We're just going to skip right over that. Well, I'll, f I'll finish that thought, Director Jefferson. <laughs> um, okay, committee report, sorry. Uh, Stack, Elise Jones. Sounds like we'll uh, need to move these pretty quickly. We spent the bulk of our time talking about the Senate Bill 267 transit project list. And um, just real briefly, the thought is to move forward with um, designating 30 to 50 million of, of the full 188 million in the transit pot largely for park and rides and then come back in 2018 and figure out how to spend the rest of that stack was generally supportive of that approach and then the rest of the time is really looking at the CDOT's producing a six billion dollar project list that would be useful used for both the Senate bill 267 project list and for a statewide transportation funding ballot initiative if it happens. So we spent a lot of time looking over that. Um, if you haven't seen that list from CDOT or Dr. Cog, you should check it out to make sure that uh, your jurisdiction's been able to provide input on that. Thank you. Metro Mayor's Director Atchison. Metro Mayor's did uh, divert from having a meeting this past month. Instead, we did have the reception for not only the legislators, uh, and the county commissioners, we had approximately 125 people who attended that evening right across the street at the Art Hotel. And to uh, Commissioner Jones, uh, Metro Mayors continues to work forward to looking at a petition-driven ballot initiative in 2018 for transportation. Still to having the discussion with CCA, uh, CCI and others on what that might look like as far as percentage. What's still on the board is everything from 0.65 to a penny. And it's no decision made on that yet. Uh, we expect to start polling on what that might be sometime in January or February and then bring that to the public. Thank you. Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Partridge. We did not meet in December, but Mayor Atchison's already reported on the legislative reception. So no further report. Thank you. Area Agency on Aging, Ms. sanchez Warren. We did not have a meeting, but I want to take this time to say thank you so much to uh, Directors Roth and Atchison for going to Washington. Um, <laughs> it was a fast trip. <laughs> uh, we got there. We had dinner. The next morning we got up. We had five meetings back to back. I mean, really quick. Uh, and uh, a lot of walking, super cold. Um, these guys had to go through security checks a lot. Um, <laughs> we all did, but the, the belts caused problems, right? <laughs> so, um, vendors would not have helped. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know what? The, uh, 
it is so valuable to have you come because they listen to you and they listen to what you say in a different way. I go a lot and I can see, sometimes it feels like they don't, I don't know if we did anything there, but I can see a cumulative effect over time. And you know, when, when Elise and, uh, when you went out and Jackie, when we went out, you know, it's building. It's, the momentum is building and uh, people listen and I'm so grateful for that. And um, the seniors of Colorado, uh, can't say thank you, but I'm saying thank you for them on their be on 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 their behalf. So uh, it was awesome. Thanks so much. And Doug, of course, you're awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, it's interesting how some metal detectors like your watch, some don't like your watch. Some of them like your belts, others don't. You know. Um, all right, the uh, rack. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we did meet this month, and uh, we approved the 2018 uh, budget and work program for the upcoming year. So that's it. E-470, Director Rakowski. Short and sweet. The widening project completed ahead of schedule, well, $1.8 million under budget. And uh, Mr. Van Meter is not here this evening, so we won't have a report on fast tracks. Am I done now? All right, had to make sure. So at, uh, if, unless there's anybody that has anything, uh, Director Jefferson. Um, you know, just being my final meeting, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone. Uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, serving uh, with all of you folks uh, over the last about two and a half years. Uh, I wanted to thank you all for being such uh, wonderful regional partners to the city of Inglewood and uh, still have a standing offer to buy lunch or dinner at my family's restaurant at the Twin Dragon on South Broadway. Uh, feel free to hit me up and take me up on that offer. Thank you again. Will you be, will you be giving out get out of jail free cards, Judge? <laughs> no, sir. I'm finding you double if you show up in my court. Just so you know. Thank you again. So reservations for 75 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have anything good uh, for the good of the cause? If not, at 8:48, we are adjourned. <laughs>